My name is Harry Wilmot, and this is the first chapter of a hopefully fascinating podcast all about immersive technology and creativity in the Southwest and beyond. My first guest is Robin Mudge. Now, I know a little bit about you from our emails, but could you reiterate that for the listener? Yeah. Uh, so how long are these episodes? <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking maybe like 20 minutes to like 40 minutes. Okay. So a commute. After uh, 18 years at the BBC, I, was, uh, I became a um, consultant in developing um, more network delivered media than broad- broadcast media and was invited to the US f- uh, to the public broadcasting uh, service there, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting specifically, um, to develop interactive products mainly for children at that time, mm. and spent 14 years in the US since. Um, having worked for the CPB and PBS, I became a, a professor at American University. Uh, where I still work on a contract basis, although live in Exeter and having just returned from the US, for a group called the Investigative Reporting Workshop, which is a production hub for um, a PBS series, uh, investigative journalism series called Frontline. Mm. Um, And my specific task is to develop interactive storytelling techniques and uh, virtual and, st- and explore storytelling techniques in the immersive world beyond interactive TV into virtual reality. Um, and my interest in virtual reality has been around for probably 20 or 30 years because with an interest in trying to get the audience involved mm-hmm. in the story and having got a background in stills photography, mm-hmm. I was very interested in panoramic photography and used to produce pa- very big panoramic pictures with a rotating what, uh, slit scan camera cool. called a round shot. Mm. Um, and print, they used to be printed about five foot tall by 20, 30 foot long, depending wow. on what the focal length of the lens was. Um, in order to give the viewer or you know, a, a, an experience of actually being there, mm. um, I used to think it was as good as being there, but every you know it's never as good as being there. Although sometimes it could have been better than being there, to be honest, because it was less dangerous than it was uh, standing looking at the picture than actually taking the photo. Yeah. But this is using traditional film, of course, roll film, and um, uh, actually printing it was quite a business, and it meant getting into digital printing at a very early stage because those were the only printers that would print long lengths, um, you couldn't, it was very hard to do it using traditional photographic yeah. paper. There was a way of doing it. They had synchronized the sort of rolling of the image on the film through the enlarger head with the movement of the paper yeah. through you know, the base of the enlarger. But that was, okay. yeah, um, <laughs> extremely expensive. Mm. So my interest in immersive media really stems from there. And, uh, you know, as things move forward, there's been all sorts of ways of actually shooting video and film in uh, VR with two back-to-back fisheye lenses and so on for a long time. It's not as new as everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. Or not everybody, but you tend to... People easily think this is a new phenomenon. And, in fact, it was around in the 15th century, VR... In a difference, in a different form, and the Victorians, of yeah, course, yeah, were masters right. of it. Yeah. Yeah, with their huge buildings with panoramic pictures inside and yeah. stereo uh, photographs and stuff. But of course, as we've moved into uh, sort of the modern era, with the ability for uh, uh, powerful processes in phone-sized packages that can do you know, really fast computations, then displaying it in real time is what's really interesting now. Yeah. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, journalism and storytelling, as, as some of the pieces started to appear in the uh, Financial Times and the New York Times, um, VR pieces, there was a significant... Um, uh, ethical issue developing in the sense that a lot of the material was w- was staged rather mm. than it actually happening for real. And of course, the reasons are obvious with a yeah. 
spherical 360 mm. degree camera, you know, you have to place it in one yeah. place. And if the action's not happening where it's happening, you have to arrange for it to happen. Mm. Um, simply because the operator, camera operator and crew would be in shot otherwise, which may or may not be acceptable. Mm. So um, I started experimenting with um, an early form of um, uh, initially 180 degree uh, VR, uh, which actually we tried at Plymouth Art College, taking still pictures with a, a circular fisheye and then projecting that still picture back into a hemispherical oh, yes. dome, right? So, and, and that dome, those dome experiences are all over the place and really popular. Mm. Um, but now, of course, you could do it uh, with a headset or on a phone yeah. or on a tablet or whatever. And uh, I started to use actually uh, some small action cameras like there's one by Kodak. There are lots now, mm. um, all of the, you know, uh, phone manufacturers actually produce uh, cameras like this. Mm. But of course the image quality is not very good. Um, so I was started, I, I then used um, a Sony FS5, which was, I'm sure everybody's yeah. familiar with, uh, and a 180 degree Nikon lens, used one. Um, and it was really interesting, but I, I didn't think that the immersive experience was uh, was was rich enough. Mm. But the really interesting thing about the, this approach was that you could start to introduce some uh, traditional documentary grammar oh, yeah. into an immersive space. Because if you, if you think about a 360 degree space, it's an open, fr there's no frame, yeah. which is what everybody says is great. Mm. Um, and there's no um, directed point of view because of that. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, you know, that's, that's brilliant. But in an equally large number of cases, after a while, there's this huge so what disassociated mm. feeling that kind of creeps in because there is no narrative. And I was reading things as, as, as the whole uh, technique was developing where people would talk about the wonderful thing about this cinematic VR um, is that you don't direct the audience in any way. And then in the next sentence saying, how do you direct the audience's yeah. attention? Yeah. So it was, a, it was quite an interesting sort of series of issues for me. And, and by the way, we're, I'm only talking about cinematic VR. I'm not talking about volumetric uh, yeah. game yeah. style VR. Um, uh, and it's interesting that there's a partial volumetric technique being a, a possible to be applied to cinematic stuff now, which is, yeah. which is interesting, yeah. um, but it's only partial. Um, so my uh, experiments then uh, took on a new uh, sort of accelerated path when a Japanese lens manufacturer developed a 250 degree fisheye lens. And when you consider that our natural yeah. field of view is about 270 mm. from looking, from turning left to turning right. It's pretty close to what we normally see. Mm. And we don't normally spend a lot of time looking behind us. No. So um, I was, I've been shooting documentary style uh, stories using this technique and being able to actually introduce some very gentle moves to uh, help um, direct the narrative while still giving a, a, a broad immersive experience. That's super fascinating. You've actually like covered a lot of things I wanted to ask you about and I think I feel the same but I've not done my own experiences that you don't need to have stuff Behind you. Behind you, because no. we don't look behind us a lot of the time. No. A lot of us just sit in the chairs and just like to move our heads yeah. around up and down yeah. a little bit. Right. It doesn't need to be behind us. Um, and you spoke a little bit before about the, the grammar of documentary filmmaking yeah. and applying that to 360 space. Can yes. you elaborate on that? Yeah, you hear a lot of people, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of the pioneers and the, the, the sort of uh, great so-called, well, I don't mean to 
uh, sound like that. But the people who've done a lot of big pieces like Chris White, uh, Chris Milk, mm. and so on, talk about the fact that it, it's not a film. Well, yeah, if you stick a, a camera stationary in a field and you can look all around you, yeah, it's not, it's not a traditional, yeah. traditional film. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't start to explore some of the storytelling techniques, grammatical storytelling techniques mm. that have developed over a long period of time and that uh, we, as a public we're kind of used to. Yeah, um, I, I'm interested to see the language of film that people are used to, how we can apply that to VR and virtual reality yeah. technology. Uh, well, um, what... It, with this particular technique, and this isn't, this doesn't apply to stereo 3D stuff, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, you can get very, very close. Uh, so when I'm shooting the story uh, with somebody and, mm -hmm. and we're discussing something, the camera is literally nine or twelve inches away from them. Gosh, okay. Right, and I, I've got the camera here. Not that that will help in a podcast, <laughs> but I'll show you later. Thank you. Um, and um, of course, there are te there are actual difficulties in shooting with it because it's looking behind it slightly at 250 degrees. Mm. You can't use the camera close to your body. The camera has to be out away from your body in order to clear you, uh, mm. to clear your body so that you're in the shad at the back side of the lens, as yeah. it were. Well, the lens weighs four pounds and the camera weighs two and a half pounds. So that's six and a half pounds. You, you cannot yeah. hold it at arm's length, hand hold it at arm's length, yeah. so you have to wear a, a, a brace okay. in order to be able to support the weight and to be able to get in there close. But nevertheless, you're very close. So you're getting all the traditional shots, uh, sort of framed shots mm. all at once. You're getting a close up of the person, a mid shot of the person, a close up of what they're talking about and uh, available uh, um, uh, close-ups and wide shots of everything around them as well. And it's the viewer who decides what the framing yeah, the is, not the editor. The viewer yeah, decides. So, but they, become they become the editor, the editor yeah. yeah. And um, in some of the VR players, particularly the one that works in uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. you can pinch and zoom on the VR that's playback. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So um, you can, you know, uh, you can virtually zoom in yeah. To, to, what, to a close-up of what they're looking at and then scroll up and look at them. You can see it all at once. Or you can choose what you want to. But in order to do that, the image quality has to be yeah. very high. And yeah. one of the bugbears of uh, uh, head, particularly headset playback systems and some of the uh, VR cameras is that the image quality is not very yeah. high. And they have to be... Um, not just 4K, they've got to be like 16K to get the full... Yes, and, and yeah, because what, what it depends upon the pixel density within the circular fisheye image. Mm. So with my 250 lens, I shoot in 5K, um, and it, you, you lose quite a lot of it because, you know, because it's a circle in a 4x3 uh, frame, right? So you, yeah. you're throwing all the stuff around the sides away in terms of uh, uh, mm. data. Um, but it gives you a really good, at the moment, um, uh, a sort of uh, image quality that allows you to pinch and zoom. And I'm talking specifically about playing back on uh, smartphones and tablets, mm. not headsets. Um, uh, do you have a preference for smartphones and why? I don't have a preference because I, I like 3D stuff. Mm. Um, but I think that, I don't think it's going to be headset 3D material that actually uh, helps propel this kind of VR experience into the general um, is that public. cinematic VR? Cinematic VR. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, yeah, that's why I, I specifically cinematic yeah. VR. If you're in a, 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 a volumetric um, sort of space, mm with a game or a space that's been recorded with volumetric cameras like LiDAR cameras and so on, where you can actually have six degrees of freedom. Yeah. You can move, you not only move your head around in the normal three degrees of freedom that we get with cinematic VR, but you can physically move backwards and forwards, left and right and up and down mm -hmm. too. Then you have no alternative, yeah. no choice, but to wear a, pair of, uh, wear a headset. 
and you know those experiences are a different experience fantastic mm -hmm. but a different experience um so you know you looking back at what happened to 3D TV and, and it died because people weren't willing to wear yeah. uh, just a regular pair of glasses. Um, so People are very lazy. Generally. Yeah, and also, you know, you have to be really enthusiastic to put a headset, yeah. a, bit, a, a VR headset on at the moment. Now, clearly, as developments mm. take place, they get smaller and smaller and higher and higher and produce higher and higher image quality. That will change. Do you think... Um, we're on the cusp of then becoming ubiquitous. What headsets? Yeah, I think it, <laughs> it's very difficult to predict anything or even think about it. But I think it's going to be a while yet. While well, yet, yeah. cool. Um, the, clearly, what, well, it recently at uh, the Sheffield Film uh, Documentary Festival, one of the leading producers of VR was saying that um, most of the big investment that was going into VR production has gone, mm. is being redirected to artificial intelligence because there's a, mm. a more immediate return on investment and people are beginning to realize that it's taking a lot longer uh, to go into the general marketplace in big numbers than, mm. than investors originally thought. So I think that's a, good, that's a sign that it's not going in as fast as everybody would like. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, the you know everybody carries a smartphone, yeah, and um, uh, via sort of immersive experiences, cinematic experiences on a smartphone are quite interesting. They're not yeah. as immersive as wearing a headset no. by any means, but they're much more yeah. interesting in some cases than than a straight flat film. Well, I say that that depends depends on what it is, of course. Mm -hmm. In your experience of your interviews, um, your one-shot VRs, have you used any on-screen text or anything to help guide the view, or have you just used those of uh, that kind of stuff as bookends, like a traditional? Um, so, with a two hundred and fifty degree field of view, in terms of directing the story, uh, no. Um, well apart from one, but that was because it was an interactive piece. Okay. Uh, so it was a, an interactive story structure, but in a VR, with, with um, 250 VR space. So the text and uh, symbols were to guide, uh, to let the viewer know that there was additional material should they want to see it. Um, but I've got uh, two pieces that are, well, yeah, two pieces that are um, hopefully uh, about to be uh, about to start. Where, well, they're actually they're they're both interactive as well. There's a lot of additional material that's flat, um, mm -hmm. in and it's a 3D piece, so they're at di in different oh, levels of planes, yes. planes, uh, and the VR component, the uh, cinematic three-dimensional. Um, spherical space is more or less a, a part of the interface. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it delivers, the idea is to explore uh, how viewers respond to the open frame intellectually mm -hmm. by comparison to a frame, framed material where we naturally process uh, and engage at a different intellectual level. So the viewer in, the, yeah. in these projects can move backwards and forwards between different intellectual experiences apart from the viewing experiences. How did you measure where they looked then? No, I mean, uh, this, I only just started these. Oh, okay. Right. So how one actually um, tracks their intellectual engagement, I think, is going to be hard. Yeah. I'm not sure where they look as particularly... It's going to give an enormous amount of information. How they describe it and how they feel is probably the mm. uh, way to a uh, subjective experience. Is uh, yeah. wh where one might get the most information. I don't know though. No. Yeah. Yeah. Figure that one out. Yeah. Both of them are hopefully being shot in Exeter. So. Oh. So yeah, and also um, the notion of empathy is 
is kind of strange. Yes, uh, that's where I kind of started my journey in the, the VR world is through working with Nick Perez at hospital, um, working with uh, 360 training environments for clinicians so they can um, be empathetic towards patients. Right. So one of the first experiments he did was he recorded himself as a patient or his view as a patient in a in an ambulance and getting treated by an ambulance crew and then he and it was a real ambulance crew yeah and then he showed it back to the the crew and then they learned f lessons from how they treated yeah. him right um and uh, working with nick in the last few months and being a part of just kind of gleaning all this kind of empathy machine information from from as what vr can be um that's where I'm coming in, but what do you think as as? Uh... Well, I think what the what you've just described is really interesting, um, but I don't think it's a, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because the one hundred and eighty degree approach gives the uh, pers the person viewing the experience the ability to actually engage with uh, more of the scene than they would otherwise have been able to. Because, you know, if it was a framed documentary, then you'd you'd have frames uh, sections of it. Mm. Uh, so, from a training point of view, I think that's fascinating. But I don't think that um, VR is and is any more an empathy machine than a piece of well written text is, mm. um, or or a regular film. Um, it, it's about story. It's mm. not about technology. Um, so, you know. Yeah, it gives a different form of storytelling, right? But this whole notion of the empathy machine, mm -hmm. I think, is is over, over emphasized by comparison to other media. Uh, leading on to that, um, I, I'd like you to try and describe what immersion means to you, and or how would you describe it? <laughs> well, of course, it's completely different, but f from um, volumetric experiences. And uh, to you know visual experiences, yeah. right? So, and we are immersed in this cinema simply because we're on the inside of it, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. right? And and we're immersed in the sense that we can move around, we can walk up to the screen, we can walk up to the you know the seats on the rake, the back of the rake mm -hmm. seats, all sorts of stuff. And of course, being able to do that in a simulated environment through volumetric experiences is 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 really interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, clearly very popular in the games that make use of this. Uh, it's a phenomenal experience, mm. sort of out of body kind of experiences yeah. that you otherwise wouldn't have. In the cinematic sense, uh, just having a field of view that matches your field of view um, is, is, is great, as long as it's not too much of a palaver to actually get it. Yeah. I mean, there was, uh, you, in Paynton, oh, actually, in um, Goodrington, when I was a kid, there, every summer a cinema used to arrive in a huge tent. It was Cinerama. Oh, yeah. Right, and it was like an early IMAX experience. Oh, that's cool. So there were, it was a huge wide screen and very tall, and, there, and the picture was shot with three cameras looking in slightly different directions, and they were all synchronized, and... and and uh, lined up on the screen, and you got this amazing experience if you sat r relatively yeah. close to the screen because it it went right out to the edges of your peripheral vision. And you know, I, proper IMAX does that as well. So that kind of being there, yeah. that feeling of presence, uh, which they you know has become the the word that describes this feeling in mm. these places, is very very um, powerful. Not necessarily from the empathetic point of view, I might add, but it gives you, you know, a really uh, unusual and new and uh, interesting experience, as long as it's something that's worth being there. Yeah. I mean, there's no point shooting in in even 250 or limited angle VR if there's no point. In, yeah. If there's nothing there to actually be of interest. Yeah, I got that. I, I'm trying to produce a, um, <coughs> a 360 library of hospital spaces right. and I did a, a trial, did a call out to the hospital, to the hospital to see if anyone was interested. 
and I got only a couple of replies and one of them was just an office and that's rather boring just a 360 view of an office yeah and um, but it needs to be an office with people interacting or needs to have some kind of narrative within yeah. that to uh, force you to look around yeah so I've just finished a piece for um, the University of San Francisco uh, public health uh, department yeah um, and uh, is the uh, Dr. Barbara, Sa Barbara Satchler is a, um, a sort of a person who is famous in teaching n the nursing staff issue, uh, how to um, identify uh, environmental hazards. Um, and, and it's not just environmental hazards in the big sense, like oil fires and yeah. stuff. It's in somebody's home, okay. right? So I, with her, created this um, VR training uh, product where um, a student can wander around, well, not wander because it's not volumetric, yeah. but move around a person's home. And there are uh, cupboards under the sink. There are various bits and pieces that, if, that have got hidden hotspots. Mm. And when they select those, they, you know, the next uh, pe uh, uh, piece of media is the door open and then they can explore the stuff inside the cupboards and identify whether these things are hazardous or not. Um, mm. And uh, what she wants to do is to actually um, record the actions so that you can, you know, uh, measure competency with the yeah. nursing student as to how, how many of these things they find. So we actually made some of them were declared so we said, you know, some of the places were really obvious yeah. and some of them were to be discovered. So at least there was some feeling of success because yeah. part, part of my earlier career was designing uh, online learning um, courses on a large scale, which is funnily enough, one of the main reasons for going to the US. So working with the learning development department, we created this VR piece. Um, and it was shot in 250, so mm. there were hot spots where you could move from place to place in the room and get a different angle of view, and then hidden hot spots to, mm. to find this stuff. Um, so from a training point of view, you know, that's, that's something that would be very difficult to do using traditional technology. Yeah, that kind of interactiveness or agency, being able to look around, yeah. makes the learning more engaging. Yes. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was interesting. I was out there shooting all of these. We did them as stills, actually, because there was no point actually running them yeah. as vid uh, in video. Because that's better yeah. quality. And yeah. Better. Oh, yeah, a quick note. Um, I wanted to make sure with this podcast that people talking about their ideas and their IP and that stuff, they feel like none of that's going to get stolen or anything uh, or, or borrowed. I just wanted to ask anybody listening if they wanted to use any of the stuff they've learned from this podcast that they contact us or, or yourself just to just to make sure. Well, you know, it, but I, I don't think that nice <laughs> I don't think there are many cases in this where anything is original IP. Yeah. I mean, the original IP comes down to stories. Mm -hmm. Right. And in some cases, uh, uh, software development and the like. But most of the VR techniques that we that are being used today have been used many, many times before, uh, um, and, and you know, way back even yeah. into the sort of fifties, sixties, and before then. So it's just a different application of existing technology. Um, uh, I've written papers about it, and if people quote the papers. Then clearly, the usual yes. academic. Uh, sensibilities are observed but you know, that's different um you know if somebody wants to shoot the 180 degree lens you know so be it yeah. i mean for, um google have now are now pushing 180 vr 180 mm. instead of vr 160 i still think 180 is actually uh, generally a little bit narrow for a, to get a decent v yeah. immersive experience from but uh, and it's in 3d so you have to wear the goggles mm. right 
uh, and the 3D side is a... Uh, there's just one bit you may be interested mm. in, and uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, another reason for using a single camera in the journalistic world is that there's no stitching to do. Mm. Right, so you can shoot a story in the morning, yeah. and as long as you've got a powerful enough computer that yeah. will render fast enough, uh, you can have it re edited and ready by the afternoon. Yeah. Whereas um, when I'm using this, um, when I'm shooting in 360, and particularly in stereo, in 3D, mm. um, you know, it's, it, it, it takes up a very yeah. long time. And also, you can't come with, if you're shooting in 3D, you can't come closer than a meter yeah. to the camera. So, it's, you know, it, uh, it's a different it's kind of experience. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying it's, uh, you know, one is better than the other because they're used for different reasons. Yeah. But uh, if you're into trying to give, a, you know, if you're trying to give a regular stories uh, or if you're a news agency or a broadcaster, then the one shot technique, as it's called, yeah. one shot VR. Uh, is a, is you know a lot faster and fits into the standard post production mm. um, you know, you workflow can, really easily. You can broadcast live from a three sixty camera these days. I think. Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, we're doing that with the one that I was going to show you later. Oh. Can you bring it out now and I'll try and describe it <laughs> sure. for, the, for the podcast. So, um, and the projects um, people people may be uh, aware of. Uh, there are two organized two charitable organizations in the Southwest, one uh, in Cornwall called Khan to Cove and uh, an equivalent in Devon called Villages in Action. And um, uh, they, are, they organize um, professional uh, arts performances, whether it be storytelling or um, uh, folk music, jazz, uh, dramatic pieces for uh, for village halls. Okay. So they deliver um, a series of art events to village halls. N not they're not in the city centres. Hmm. It's an arts council funded project to take um, art to into yeah, yeah into rural areas. Right. Um, so you probably and uh, villages in action actually. Uh, lost its funding, unfortunately, but the work of Villages and Action was taken over by Khan to Cove in, out of Red Ruth in Cornwall. Um, and as part of this project, you probably heard you know, a, lot of, a lot of talk about issues surrounding isolation and loneliness. Yeah. And even in these villages, there's um, a significant number of people don't go to the village performances because of disability, because of old age, because of all sorts of stuff. So um, the, the guy that runs it, um, Tim Smithers and myself, were talking one about you know, how we could, uh, well, we were talking about various other VR projects actually, and I was saying to him, well, we should live stream the performances, yeah. um, taking into account that some uh, internet access is tricky, yeah. right? which is another problem. Uh, and we were going to uh, live stream it uh, just f as regular live streams. Um, but we were, we, whilst we were talking about it, we thought we discovered that you could live stream from various cam 360 cameras. It might be interesting to try it to do the live stream in 360. Yeah. Uh, so um, this particular camera, well, there are several, but this particular camera live streams in very high quality. And what is this camera? This is um, called uh, an Obsidian um, uh, R for high resolution um, by a, a company called Ken, Kenboa. So this is a tip. This is absolutely typical is, uh, VR camera, right? It's very heavy. It's kind of a, a smooth hexagonal. Um, kind of looks like a, a, a cylinder with lots of theta S's <laughs> on the side. Yeah. to it. Uh, six. Six. Yeah. So, um, and uh, it's relatively small, and yeah. you just put it on a VR pole, and the idea is that we find an interesting part within the performance. And then there's a single, um, well, actually, there's a Wi-Fi unit that fits on the bottom. Nice. 
Um, and then um, I'll, I'll get that out in a moment. Uh, a game style laptop. Oh yeah. So it has to have a, so a beefy a beefy graphics card in it. Processes the material live and then sends it out to where whatever live from, from, live from here. Gosh, no, it must right. be powerful. And um, you can you, you can either fit a <coughs> excuse me um, H2N you know um, uh, surround sound microphone oh, yeah. on the top, Pre preferably that because it's harder to process the other surround sound mm. mics in real time anyway. Uh, and you can either just stream it in 2D or you can actually stream in 3D, but that would be just taking things too far, yes, I think. So, um, and as I say, clearly there are issues with <laughs> access to the internet yeah. associated with this. But, the, but it is an attempt to try and get people who otherwise, some of the people who mm. otherwise wouldn't be involved in, involved. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. So that's, you know... That ca that camera, and the other one, the two the two fifty cameras here. So it's recording in vlog. Oh yeah. Um. Or it, it's set to vlog, but there you go. Wow. So it's it's yeah. It's you, heavy. Take on the weight. There you go. Oh, that's a lot of fun. I um, when I first got a, a video camcorder, yeah. it was about twelve. Uh, one of the first things I did is I went and bought a, a wide-angle lens attachment to it and yeah. it sends me right back. So you will probably see that you've got your hand in the picture. Yes. Right. And I'm holding my hand uh, in the behind north. the lens, yeah. it seems. And that's amazing. Yeah, that's quite incredible. And it is, it is just a little bit smaller than our, my um, actual... So the way in which this you have to use this is that I don't know if you've seen those fishermen with with belts on where they put the, pole, uh, the fishing yes, pole. Yes. Yeah. So there's you wear one of those yeah. belts, and there's a mono there, there's a uh, the re, there's a pair of rails that support this. Oh yeah. Um, like a rig. Thing. Yes, it's a rig, and the rails extend backwards with two handles on, right? Gotcha. And um, and then. There's a monopod with a uh, ball and socket joint that goes on there. And so you can hold the camera about a meter in front of you and control it with, because you, these two handles are connected to the rods, right? And you can get really close. So you, as you know, I'll be shooting yeah, here most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want to put a link in for where some of these experiments are. Yes, yeah, um, to your one-shot VRs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that in the description or, or yeah. wherever this is. Yeah. Is it possible to take a selfie so I can post this next to us? And it's a, a, G, a Lumix G... GH5. GH5, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'll send you that. Oh, gosh, awesome. So... Um, um, yeah, I'll definitely post a link to the the places uh, that you'll do this. Absolutely mad. So um, <laughs> this will be a, a goodbye now. Okay. And this will be the last thing we do. Uh, Robin, thank you very much for talking to me and I look forward to talking to you again. Okay, pleasure. Mm. But that was absolutely fascinating and there's, there's so many other um, different avenues of chat we could, could have gone down <laughs> um, that I might invite you back for another session at some point um, in the future and maybe have another one of the Southwest Creative Technology Fellow guys with us um, so they can chat to you as well. It'd be great. Um, okay, thanks. If, if anybody listening to this wants to get in contact with you about anything you've just said, how can they do that? So my email address is robin, R-O-B-I-N, at digital slate, that's D-I-G-I-T-A. L L S L A T E. Nice. <laughs> and that's um, yeah. dot com. This first chapter of Immersive Talk was produced by Harry Wilmot, featured Robin Mudge, and was recorded in the Studio 74 Cinema at Exeter Phoenix. I want to shout out to Jonas Hawkins for sorting that out last minute. The intro and outro music is called Miss You Meteo by Ice Cream Cult, and I found it on cchound.com. If you have any feedback, please send it to harrywilmot at gmail.com. Thanks again.